Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Team Building Podcast. I am Matt Johnson. I've got the man, the myth, the legend, Jeff Cohn, with me here. As always, we're going to talk about how to test and scale new lead sources. We're going to talk about the three buckets of leads and get into some really, really awesome in-depth stuff that's going to help you generate and convert leads in your real estate business. So, as I said, the man, the myth, the legend, Jeff is with me, hat and all, as always. Jeff Cohn, what's up? Hi, Matt Johnson. Dude, super pumped today just to have it, you and me. Obviously, we love to have guests on the show, uh, but when it's just you and I, I think we can get through a lot of content, and the content today is going to be really good, you guys. I'm excited to share uh, my journey. I'll kick it off with this, wanting to figure out how to generate leads. Of course, if you're just working your sphere of influence and you're still servicing the business, that's the best place for you to spend your time. The challenge is when you decide you don't want to service the business any longer or you want to generate additional revenue through adding agents and generating leads for them and holding them accountable to working those leads, you can't share all your sphere business or else you won't have any sphere to work. So in the beginning, went back taking my journey back to 2011, I had to figure out a way to generate leads. Of course, leads come from more than just internet leads. There's mm -hmm. sphere leads. You can teach your agents how to engage their sphere, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. There's prospecting leads where you're doing outbound cold calling, you know, expired, FISBO, just listed, just sold, open houses, mastermind groups. And then there's internet leads, which I would say you throw that, cast that net across anything that comes off the internet. It could be an organic search on your site through search engine optimization. It could be a Facebook post that you put out organically for free or a Facebook ad, Google ads, Craigslist. The list goes on and on. So we're going to really get into all of that. But the number one thing when you leave our podcast today is you will feel more empowered to make the right decisions and where you want to deploy your personal capital or the capital of your lender and vendor partners. So you're sure you're getting the greatest return on investment. <clears throat> and we're going to give you the formula so you can year after year dissect where your leads are actually coming from and where you need to double down, triple down on your lead gen efforts. Yeah. So Matt, where should we get started, man? Well, let's start with this. I'm, I'm curious just in terms of where you're at right now, because you, you kind of have your main lead sources set, but then you always set some some money or a percentage of uh, you know of revenue or investment aside to test yep. new lead sources. So I want, to, I want you to give people an idea of where you're at now. So the people that feel like, hey, I already know what works. Now I need to kind of figure out what's the next thing. Let's start. Yep. Let's let's talk about what is the mental thought process that you go through of how to start testing out a new lead source. I love it. The first thing is anytime you're going to deploy capital into a lead source, you need to give it at least 12 months. So I don't care if you're putting a hundred dollars a month or five thousand dollars a month, whatever you choose to agree to put your money towards, do it for 12 months. And the reason for that is we found over the last three years, we've tracked every time a lead registers to where the lead goes under contract. And on average, a lead that registers on your website, the average is seven months before it goes under contract. The median is five months. So just give or take, call it six months. If you're paying for a lead source for six months and you don't close one deal, that's the norm. That's the average. You shouldn't expect to have one sale until the sixth month mark. And then after the six month mark, you'll start to see that pick up. So a lot of people give up after how many months? Three, four months. Oh, it didn't work. Zillow sucked. Tiger lead sucked. Boomtown sucks. Everybody wants to blame it on the lead sources. The truth is it's you sucked because you weren't willing to wait long enough to allow the campaign to prove itself. I've never lost money. Most teams have never lost money that track their deals from any one lead source. We always have had a positive return on investment because the leads are so inexpensive in most places to generate and the commissions are so great that you really don't have to win very many times to be able to offset the cost of the lead generation. So today I teach that people should put 70% of their marketing spend towards their top three lead sources. If you don't know what your top three lead sources are, look at all your sales last year and look to see where those leads came from. Hopefully you're tracking that. If you're not, start tracking that now. For most teams that aren't really sure, you haven't found that, I call it flow or clarity yet in your lead gen efforts, we would recommend you put a, a majority of your money into two or three sources, work behind those sources for a year, and then every year decide maybe you'd put about 25% towards something new to see if it will work better in your market versus what you're already trying to do. And you don't have to do just one thing. A lot of teams I know, Matt, and you'd probably agree with me, do one lead source. You know, you can split it up a little bit, do two or three don't do 10. You know, we went out in 2011, we visited over 50 real estate teams. And one of the dysfunctions we saw was people were putting their time and energy into too many things. What we found is we've draw, drawn a direct parallel line between 
people and leads. And there's no difference between a lead that comes off of Google ads versus Facebook versus Craigslist versus Zillow. They're all the same people. They're people that were just on a, they went down a rabbit hole and some website forced them to register. And when I say there's no difference, we track average sales price from every rabbit hole. We track average time in our database before they go under contract. We track what percentage are buyers, what percentage are sellers. And yeah, there's are some differentials, but not enough for it to matter. So for example, our Craigslist leads buy 15, buy homes that are worth 15% less than our Air, um, Omaha's average sales price. Whereas a Google ad is just, just the average sales price, but so what? 15%, it's 180,000 versus 220,000. Yeah, and there so, was a time when even that didn't hold up. Like there was, there yeah, was there, one year there, where it was markedly different, and then there was another year where it was right on par yeah. with average. So even that doesn't doesn't consistently hold up. Yep, I agree. So I think the big thing to take away from this for those listening is leads are leads are leads and people are people are people. Find the lead sources that you can where you can essentially buy a person's fit, um, phone number, email address for the least amount of money. So currently, and this is what it's been like for the last six years, we joined Boomtown in 2011. They told me they'd generate a couple hundred leads overnight, and I didn't believe it because up to that point, I had had an organic site, theconeteam.com. We maybe generated five leads a year off this website. Uh, we didn't drive traffic to it. We didn't do SEO. It was really an online business card because everybody expected you to have a website. And so... Um, right out of the gate, September of 2011, we joined Boomtown, and I got a lender, two lenders, to partner to pay for the Boomtown platform and then pay 500 a month in ad spend to generate leads. And in the first 30 days, I generated 300 registered internet leads. And I didn't even believe it. I'm going through these names. I'm like, no way is this real. So I start calling, and it's like real people. They gave me their real phone number, their real email address, and I'm like, this is insane, 300 leads. And so that's what compelled me to hire six agents within 60 days. So by November of 2011, I had six agents. I was generating 300 leads a month. Um, and I ended up going from my best year, which was 80 deals, to that following year. In, year in 2012, we did 240 sides for $42.5 million in volume. All of that happened because we had all those leads that were coming in. And so what we've learned from then till now is that Google AdWord leads work. You can convert them. And so do all the other lead sources, but someone has to work them systematically to be able to convert at 3%, which is our average conversion ratio. So I spend 330 to 660 to make $3,500. And the beauty is I'm not even spending the money on the leads. I'm getting my lender and vendor partners to spend the money on the leads. So if I look at the true return on investment, it's infinite. That's like a 7X, 8X return. So anyone listening, this is totally doable in your market. Everyone should be doing this in their market. The challenge isn't the leads. The challenge is the work behind the conversion of the leads. That's where the rubber meets the road, and that's where the systems, Elite Real Estate Systems teaches. That's what's going to really help differentiate a team that functions with two or three agents versus a team that can function with 10 to 20 to 50, which is where we are today. So this is where I feel like a lot of people, whether it's entrepreneurs in real estate or not, a lot of people struggle with this. <clears throat> So in real estate, there is a proven model, a uh, performance model for how to generate sale, like you mentioned, the other two buckets, right? Sphere and prospecting. Extremely proven, right? Extremely predictable. The only variable is really just the skills of the salesperson involved, right? So if you apply yourself, you build the skills, you do the work, you're going to get a certain result, right? All that is known. When you jump into the internet lead source game, there, there are some proven models out there, and Jeff, you've got one, and other people might have others. However, for the average person, they're stepping kind of out into the unknown. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And, that, and I think that's why people like that, when you get that phenomenon of people quitting within two or three or four months, that's why they're quitting is because yeah. they're stepping into the unknown, and they're stepping into the realm of really true entrepreneurship which is yep. building a model that isn't yet proven and figuring out something that works for you. And so right. I just wanted to go back and kind of simplify and revisit some of the things that you probably sped quickly through because you kind of gave an overview of your experience. I want to pull a couple things out. Yep. Number one, commit to it for 12 months, right? Yep. So number two is that you're looking at and you're kind of figuring out what your key metrics are, hopefully in advance. Now, in some cases, you won't always know what those are, but now you know what they are. So we're talking about the cost per lead, right? Yep. The uh, well, the cost per click, the cost per lead, and then the lead conversion ratios, essentially, right? Yep. And this is simple stuff. Everyone's worried about this. A lot of times, if you're using like a Boomtown system, most of the lead gen companies are going to track all this on the back end for you. But mm -hmm. even if you just went out and did this on your own, you could hire my guy in the, the Dominican Republic to post to Craigslist as an example. Mm -hmm. You'd pay him around $400 a month. He'd post 100 houses a day. Every lead that came in from him, you could track those leads every month. So you would know, let's say it's 100 leads that came in. So if you paid $400 and 100 leads came in, how much is that per lead? 
I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> four dollars. Four hundred bucks up for a hundred leads, you said? Four bucks a lead, yeah. Yeah. Four bucks yeah. a lead. So let's say that you determine it takes twenty of those opportunities to convert one sale. You take four times twenty and you're eighty bucks to convert a deal. Pretty good deal. So that is the simple math. What's nice is in Boomtown, it tracks all that for me across a bunch of different lead gen platforms. And it shows you the percentages of how many clicks to get a lead. Um, and then of course I know how many leads to convert a deal. The only way to know that though is you have to put those deals in as closed, you know, as pendant right. and closed deals. And a lot of yeah. people aren't tracking that. So yeah. for anyone listening to this that doesn't know their conversions and doesn't know if it, their in, you know, investments are actually getting them positive returns, you just need to start tracking it. And the best way to track it is to re require your admin to track it. And if you're tracking things on your own, require yourself to track it. I won't pay my agents out until they indicate to me where that lead came from. And in most instances, I already know because the back end of our system tracks where each lead source comes from. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so yeah, so you're committing to a certain time frame, and then you're tracking if you know two to three key metrics along the way. So that way, you know, you know, some semblance, you have some sense of the results that are coming in. Because at two, three, four months, you may not have closed deals necessarily, but you should have deals either in the pipeline or or active leads that right. you know are about ready to pop. Yep. When right? a lead so, source doesn't work, when someone says it doesn't work, doesn't work to me means no one's signing up. That's okay. the only time it doesn't work. If people are signing up, the only thing not working is you and your dialogue. So that's that's a big part of this is right. knowing how to engage the best way, which we could talk about that at the end of this podcast if we have some extra time. That's a whole nother conversation. But one thing I want to make sure the audience takes away from this, if you're going to personally service the business, do not generate internet leads. They are the worst place to generate leads. They, they take the most amount of time and they are, they're probably arguably, arguably the most costly if you're personally servicing them. So it all comes back to what you're worth per hour. If you worked, you know, 40 hour work weeks, 50 weeks out of the year, and last year you made $100,000, you're worth $50 an hour. So every time you spend an hour doing something, you need to make sure you earn more than 50 bucks. Working internet leads, I don't think would be worth your time. I think you should spend your a majority of time if you're still servicing, calling your sphere of influence and offering them something of value. Next step would be prospecting in some area where you have a competitive advantage, like calling a neighborhood that you sell a majority of homes in or calling expired leads to tell expired leads about all of your successes. The internet leads is the last bucket. The only reason I turned that flow on was because I knew I personally didn't want to have to service the business the rest of my life. And I honestly thought, Matt, back when I was 31 and I launched our, our team, Omaha's Elite Real Estate Group, I thought maybe into my mid-50s, if I started in my 30s, 20 years later, maybe that, that wheel could generate the same income I was earning selling. And at the time, I was making $350,000 net selling. Two years later, I quit servicing the business. My team made me, my first year, my team made me over $200,000. I made a half a million dollars. I sold and my team was selling. And that's where the light bulb went on. I'm like, well, what would happen if I quit selling and I focused on building a real estate business? So I doubled my agent count, doubled my lead count. Of course, I've done that now three or four more times. So we're up to 50 agents, 2,000 leads a month. People are always like, well, how much bigger do you want to get? And I'm like, who asks that? Like, real, I honestly feel like real estate agents are the only people in any entrepreneurial venture that say, how much bigger would you want to get? Like, as if it's a bad thing. Right. And I always joke, McDonald's never apologizes for winning against Burger King, be it that they have 10 times as many restaurants. In what other entrepreneurial venture are people like, wow, you opened up your 22nd car wash? And like, people like... Like, I don't understand it. Well, like, I think I it goes, it goes to the root of this. Uh, well, I'm sure that's part of it. Yeah. But I think it goes to this fundamental thing, which real estate has probably more than a lot of other industries, which is the whole rock star kind of it's a handicap, yes. really, because yes. we're so focused on building rock star, like high profit businesses where really what it comes down to is it's the entrepreneur themselves doing all the work that makes that business profitable. So you have to have a scalable, and this is from Gary Keller himself. I went to his class in Austin a couple of years ago. He said, any business that's going to expand within a city, across the state, or across the country has to have a systematic approach to leveraged lead generation. You cannot systematically leverage lead generation when it comes to your sphere. You arguably can when it comes out on prospecting if you hire outside or inside sales agents. But the best way is through internet lead generation. It does work. People will tell you it doesn't. It only doesn't work because the agents working them don't work. Ooh, that's a good quote. Will you capture that and put that somewhere? <laughs> it only doesn't work if the agents working the leads don't right. work. Yes, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, well, Here let's, we uh, oh man. Well, we, we promised that we would mention briefly about how to, how to scale up a little bit on the, on the sphere side. So let's say you are in a rockstar business 
And yep. let's say you want to, you enjoy, I mean, there are people out there that enjoy that part of the business. Yes, they're building a team. They want yep. leverage. And they want, they want the lifestyle, but they want to keep servicing the people yep. that they love and they're, that are passionate about helping. So. And I'm still servicing too, Matt. I'll go on listing presentations for VIPs and certain mm-hmm. clients for one yeah. hour. And it's actually right. my highest income producing activity. I make seven grand an hour yeah. doing that. All right. So how do you scale up uh, a little bit on the, uh, on the personal sphere? That's easy, guys. Number one, more conversations with more people that you know, that know you like you trust you or that you need to get to know you like you trust you. So I, I really um, subscribe to the Michael Mayer strategy in seven levels of communication where you go out to lunch, go to happy hour, grab coffee, grab drinks, whatever, with as many people as possible. And your entire focus needs to be to bring value to them and their life, their business, their family, whatever the important thing is that they want to talk about. And you become the uniconnector. And so every person you're meeting with, you're introducing them to someone else. And then that other someone else, you're introducing them to someone else. And all of these people start to feel indebted to you. So when they come across someone, all you say to them is, you know, I know I introduced you to so-and-so, but all I could ask of you is that when you come across someone you know moving into Omaha or into your city or that's considering selling their property, that you'd send them my way. And I would love to, you know, take care of them and make sure they get the best service possible. The sad thing is no one refers an agent because of the great service they offer. People refer agents because they have a relationship with them. That's a big takeaway. Even if you're the best and have the best widget, no one knows you. If no one knows you, they're not going to use you. Mm-hmm. And so not only do you cre- you become this unit connector and help other people be successful at the things they're wanting to be successful at, you also ask them for an opportunity to share with them your buyer presentation or your seller presentation for 15 or 20 minutes in person or over the internet and show them the value that you offer. So you're not just a realtor like everybody else. You actually have a USP, a unique selling proposition that they then can share with family and friends when they have opportunities to refer. And so the agents I know of, and I could list them off on probably one hand that make over a million dollars a year and are still servicing, they each spend over three hours a day, five days a week prospecting. That's where you pick up, where is it? You pick up this really cool device, um, Apple does a good job, but there's lots of other companies that make them and you make a phone call like old fashioned and you could use Mojo dialer if you want to be on a dialer and you can be fancy and put on a headset, but you engage with humans, you talk to them, you become friends with them, you follow up with them systematically every quarter and you add value to their life and you become, you matter in their, in their world. And if you want to take it the next step further, you learn to communicate in their way. If they don't want to talk on the phone, they prefer Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook or whatever, message them the way they want to be messaged, but show them that you actually care about them. Read how to win friends and influence people before you try influencing people. Don't just call someone and say, the greatest compliment you could ever give me is a referral from you of your family and friends. I like I cringe when I see that yeah. on a business card. Do not do that. <laughs> but those are, that's uh, how will, you engage with your sphere. I will agree, and I will add to that, that uh, a lot of the agents that I know of that are still successfully working their sphere uh, in a scalable way, like the, the the addition, like the scaling component isn't just scaling up the number of conversations, although that's definitely one way to do it. And that's the, uh, the foundation way to do it. Um, I would add to that events because that gives you a scalable way to take those, those one-on-one phone conversations into the real world where you can yeah. have scalable relationships. With I people. love it. And a lot of younger people, I feel like millennials, Z and Y gen are scared to engage, but if you have something you can invite them to, so we start, you said events, right? So we started doing quarterly charity events. So we have an event this Saturday to fight diabetes in children. Um, last quarter, we did a Humane Society event raising money for pets. Um, we've done a back-to-school event, but it gives you an excuse to invite your family and friends to come out to an event. Um, all, obviously, every six months or every year, you can have a past client and sphere party. Um, most of the time, you can rent out a movie theater for two, you know 500 bucks not a huge cost and get people all in one room where you get to share a message and then watch ET and they'll usually do throwbacks like where you can play a movie. I know in Omaha, the Alamo will do that. So I think that's a great idea. Have an event and giving them a reason. Another thing I want to throw out there for anyone not already doing this, I will tell you right now, everyone, you know, that knows your name wants an automatic email every time a house hits the market in their neighborhood, letting them know what's going on with the real estate market in their subdivision. Most people's homes are their biggest investment. I've never had someone say, no, Jeff, I don't want to be emailed every time a house hits the market or every time a house sells and sells in my neighborhood. Everyone wants that. So the, the gold is where in the subject heading, you say new listing from insert your name and people start to assume 
all of these homes that are getting listed are your listings. That's not what you're trying to say. You're trying to remind them, hey, Jeff's in real estate, Matt's in real estate, Jeff's in real estate, Matt's in real estate. But the subject says new listing from Jeff Cohn, new listing from Jeff Cohn, new listing from Jeff Cohn. So when they think to sell in two or three years and they have 27 agents to choose from because people do have 27 agents to choose from, they think of Jeff Cohn because I'm the one that's constantly hitting their inbox. You can set that up for free through your MLS. You can hire a, an assistant to go through and look up everybody in your sphere's addresses. They can find it on the county records and set them up on an auto email. Um, I think that the biggest thing there, and Frank Klesitz has shared this with me, is you can ultimately build your own Google. You don't have to be dependent on generating ads, if you create a database of all the people that live in your city, then you have that entire database that you can market to. And right now we went from 1,000 back in 2011 to over 200,000 email addresses in our database today in 2018 that we're marketing to. And our goal is to have everyone set up on an auto email, letting them know, you know of houses that hit the market in their neighborhood or sell in their neighborhood. So right. really easy give and everyone wants to have that. All right. Well, let's finish out with this. This is a question from David. It says, what should you do in a very uh, low uh, inventory environment? And he gives an example. Uh, his farm of a thousand homes has an eight percent turnover, but that only translates to like two or three properties for sale at any one time. So, Jeff, is there any specific? Yeah, I've heard uh, this one guidance? a lot. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You need to move. <laughs> <laughs> and I honestly do have, have this come up. You know, Adam Hergenrother is a great example. He, yeah. I think he struggled with a pretty small market in Virginia, and he's built, I think he has over 20 expansion teams, maybe 10. I'll puff the numbers at him. He has 20 expansion teams killing it all over the place. So don't be scared to create a business. I like to call it virtual agent, where you might start opening other shops across your state or within all of the neighboring cities, and I'm sure you've already thought of this, and maybe it's not going to be an option. If that's not an option and you're not interested in doing it, you have to motivate people to sell. So you have to cold call someone that doesn't have their property on the market and explain to them how great of a market it is. Just door knocking, show up with a market analysis already prepared for their property, which is simple to do if you're staying in subdivisions. And I don't know if you have subdivisions, if it's rural, but essentially pull, pull comps together so you can show up, share a quick presentation if they're there. If they're not home, you leave a quick handwritten note and put the CMA in their door. I like to grab FedEx envelopes to stick these into because you can get the FedEx, uh, FedEx envelopes for free and then you can seal them and everyone's going to open. I hope this is legal, but I, we've done this with expired letters. You, you leave a FedEx envelope on a door, someone's opening it up. If you have it with your real estate logo and they can tell it's just sales crap, they're going to throw it into a garbage can. Everyone's opening up a FedEx envelope. So um, you, you have to create demand in your marketplace and, and or expand into other markets and show people why they need to either purchase, you know, buy land, buy investment properties, sell their properties because the market's high, interest rates are going up, create some type of a fear factor to motivate people to make a decision. Gotcha. All right. Awesome. And with that said, thanks so much for watching and listening and supporting and all that good stuff that you guys do. And we will see you on the next one.